I don't know how to follow that. So <laughs> the best way I can think of following it is simply saying, thank you, Dr. Hamry, and thank you, Dr. Esper, and please join me in another round of applause for our special recipients. Well, perhaps the way you follow something like that is you offer words of gratitude. So that's what you're going to indulge me in for the next few minutes. Let me begin with the amazing trustees that are before me right now. I am so grateful for the support and your participation today. To Governor Wilson and his lovely wife, Gail, thank you for being here. I'll get through the end, and then I'm asking you for an extended applause. Michael Castine, Ben Sutton. I think Fred Ryan may have just left, but I'll include him as well, our chairman of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation Institute. Andrew Littlefair and his wife, Karen, and Peggy Noonan. Thank you so much for being here today. And as you know, you hear me every year refer to all the people that make this happen. And they're worthy of mention every year. To our partners and sponsors, to the delegations from the Department of Defense, the congressional delegation, our foreign delegation. I see their ambassadors and ministers of defense in the room. We are grateful for your partnership and participation. And then for the amazing team here at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation Institute. As many of you know, I reside in DC. and lead our institute in DC, but we are one organization here at the foundation. One of the special treats of this forum is that it brings together the East Coast team with the West Coast team. We have lots of business people here, and you know you don't take integration for granted. You don't take for granted collaboration. And the success of this event is a testament to the way this foundation operates on two coasts, working together collaboratively. Really grateful for this amazing team. I'll highlight Melissa Giller and Joanne Drake here out in California that make this so much easier. And then to the executive committee of the Reagan National Defense Forum, our founder of the forum, Bob Cochran, his lovely wife Kelly is here. It's great to have you here, Kelly. Our policy director, Rachel Hoff. Our chief of staff in DC, Meredith Staza. Please join me in a long thank you for all those wonderful people. One more here who merits special and individual applause, and that is to John Highbush, our visionary leader of this foundation and just a wonderful human being. We will absolutely miss John's leadership, and he was always welcome here at the Reagan National Defense Forum. Please join me in thanking John. All right, to the business at hand. The time has finally come. We've reached the final panel of the 2022 Reagan National Defense Forum. Now, in recent years, this panel has been a conversation among former secretaries of defense and national security leaders. and has become known as the Panetta Panel. <laughs> For our most stalwart panelist, the former defense secretary and CIA director. This year, Secretary Panetta will be joined by Secretary Esper for the second year in a row. And we're excited to add former Director of National Intelligence, John Ratcliffe, the predecessor to Avril Haines, who we heard from earlier today. And our thanks to our returning moderator, Bill Hemmer of Fox News. Now this year, we're also mindful of a painful absence. As you all know, we lost former Secretary Ash Carter this year. He was a friend and colleague to so many of you. Certainly, he was a great friend to the Reagan Library and the Reagan National Defense Forum. And so let me close with these words from our friend from his 2016 remarks at the Reagan National Defense Forum in his final weeks serving as a Secretary of Defense. He said, and I quote, each of you knows well that America's defense is so vital 
that we to whom it is entrusted must ensure its continuity and excellence across the years and across the domains of armed conflict, not just in the air, sea, and land, but also in space, cyberspace, from strategic era to strategic era, from presidential administration to presidential administration, across our government and across our parties." End quote. He said it well, as he so often did. Would you all join us in a brief moment of silence and gratitude for our departed friend? Thank you, and thank you, Ash Carter. And now, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude the 2022 Reagan National Defense Forum, please welcome former Secretaries of Defense Leon Panetta and Mark Esper, former DNI John Ratcliffe, and my friend, moderator Bill Hemmer. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having us back uh, on behalf of the Fox News family. Uh, it's always great to come out here and be a part of these panels, and uh, I speak on behalf of my colleagues and our uh, level of appreciation that we're going to express to the library and all of you who have made the trip out here. Or if you're local, welcome home. Um, <clears throat> gentlemen, how are we doing? Great. Nice to Good. see you. This time Hello. last year, he had a book coming out. He said, I'm going to get it out, Hammer. And I, it happened, right? It, it happened. It happened. You didn't read it yet? I, I'm on that. <laughs> <laughs> didn't how you on your show? <laughs> we'll give you a plug. You're good? Absolutely. All right, Secretary Panetta. <laughs> Uh, and John, welcome to the panel Thank here. You. It's good to have you here in Grateful Valley. Grateful for the opportunity. Good um, to see you. The, the um, theme this year is protecting peace, projecting strength, uh, which sounded to me a lot like peace through strength. And did a little digging, and I found out peace through strength is a phrase that's been around for a long time. Uh, 100 AD, 1900 years ago, history tells us the Roman Emperor Adrian talked about it. Uh, our first president, the father of America, George Washington, referenced it during our uh, nation's infancy, 1793. Alexander Hamilton argued for it in Federalist 20, number 24. Uh, the Eighth Air Force adopted it as motto in 1944. Peace through strength has appeared in the Republican platform every year going back to 1980. And in the summer of 1980, in July of that year, in Detroit, <coughs> Michigan, then candidate Ronald Wilson Reagan said, we know only too well that war comes not when the forces of freedom are strong, but when they are weak. It is then that tyrants are tempted. And that is where we begin this evening. Gentlemen, thanks again. Secretary Panetta, since this is your panel, how good... <laughs> shot number one. How good are we as a nation today in projecting strength? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation to be able to come here and uh, be able to really participate in what I think is uh, one of the finest uh, defense forums that we have in this country. It brings together uh, Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives, private sector, public sector, uh, all coming together to make sure that we maintain uh, a strong national defense. And so I pay tribute to all the people that are involved here at the Reagan Institute for putting this on. And I want to also pay tribute to my colleague uh, for receiving the Reagan Award and John Hamry for receiving the uh, Reagan Award as well. Two, I couldn't think of two people more deserving to receive that award. Uh, I, think, uh, I think it's very important in a very dangerous world. And I, I think we, we continue to live in a dangerous world. Uh, we can't forget that. Uh, we have more flashpoints in the world we're living in today than probably uh, World War II. Uh, you know, we're obviously confronting Russia now in the Ukraine. We have China, we have North Korea, we have Iran, we have terrorism. We have the whole battlefield of cyber that's taking place. This is a dangerous world. Uh, and the United States has to be well prepared to deal with those challenges. Uh, and the fact is that uh, I do believe that American leadership in the world uh, is back. I mean, there was a period of time when we were essentially talking about 
uh, isolating ourselves from the rest of the world uh, and not building our alliances and not strengthening uh, those that have to work with us in order to confront those danger points that I just talked about. Uh, I think we now have made clear that the United States does have a very important role going back to World War II to be a world leader. And if we're not a world leader, very frankly, no one else will be. So I, I think that today we have restored that leadership. I think we do project strength in the sense that we've been able to put together a strong alliance with NATO in order to confront Putin uh, in Ukraine. I think we need to do more of that. I think the, probably the biggest challenge right now is to make sure that we stay united in support of the Ukraine so that we make clear to the world that the United States and our allies are going to be behind Ukraine and their courageous fighters and that Putin is not going to win, period. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, we're going to hit all these hot spots uh, over the course of the next 40 minutes or so. Secretary Esper, how, how good are we today at projecting strength? And do you, do you mirror the comments about leadership today in America? Well, I, I do mirror the comments. I mean, we, look, we have great capacity to project strength and power abroad. We always have. We hope we will. We need to sustain that. I think as we look at, into the Indo-Pacific, I, I think the challenge is to be able to project that power quickly and with allies, and I think that's something we need to continue to work on. I think we've, we've done great work in terms of enabling and assisting the Ukrainians with uh, uh, materiel, equipment, arms, munitions. It has exposed a shortcoming, I think, in our ability to regenerate power quickly in the, in the, in the form of uh, ammunition and, uh, and, uh, and parts and things like that. So that's something I think we need to look at. I understand that Congress is, is looking at. But I think at the end of the day, uh, and, and Ronald Reagan epitomized this, we need United States leadership in the world. It's United States leadership that, in the case of Ukraine, rallied our NATO allies, rallied the Europeans, and really brought in uh, partners from around the world, uh, Korea, Japan, Australia, et cetera, et cetera, to stand behind the Ukrainians. Because, look, this is more than just a war between Russia and Ukraine. This is the opening battle in this 21st century conflict between democracy and autocracy. And it was very important that the Western democracy stood up to Russia and push back because Beijing was watching and is watching very closely what we do and what we'll do going forward. Uh, Director Ratcliffe, how would you address this? Uh, it's hard to follow um, those comments any more eloquently. I do, I do want to say, um, first off, um, it's an honor for me to be here and to share stage with, uh, with these gentlemen uh, and particularly to be here. Those of you, um, before I was Director of National Intelligence, I served uh, uh, three terms in, in the House of Representatives. Um, and uh, if you ever came into my congressional office, what you saw was uh, a Penley uh, painting of, of Ronald Reagan uh, saluting whoever came through the door. So uh, uh, it, for me to have the opportunity to be here at the Reagan Library at this forum uh, is really uh, an unimaginable honor for me. But, um, but, but really well said. I, 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 I really enjoyed your um, remarks and as you talked about um, uh, what we have at stake here and protecting this democracy and we talk about projecting uh, strength and protecting peace you know, and we look at I know we're going to go around the world and talk about the different things um, that are happening but you know w one of the strengths there and one of the ways that we uh, project that strength is um, is through our own people I mean we are still when we talk about what's happening you know with Russia with China in Iran North Korea our adversaries um, they don't have what we have, which is um, a country where everyone can go as high and as far as their own hard work, determination, and abilities can carry them. That's, that's what the world wants. That's what those citizens of those countries want, and we project strength by protecting that. Uh, Peggy Noonan earlier today referenced it as an agitated world. Uh, I look forward to seeing that phrase in a Wall Street Journal piece sometime very soon. I'm not, <laughs> I think she nailed it. But, but what she said after that was that all of us can reel off the flashpoints, I mean, just, just like you did, Secretary Panetta, a moment ago. Um, so let's get there. Let's go to Iran. Uh, you were CIA director in 2009. The Green Revolution starts. It has burned less bright since, and now they're back on the streets today uh, through multiple cities throughout that country. Should we not project strength by being more vocal in our support for the women in Iran today? Well, I, you know, I, I think the United States... Uh, 
has made clear our, our support for uh, what the women are on the streets uh, protesting in Iran. Uh, I, I do think that this, this is one of those moments in time when whether it's protests in China or protests in Iran, where the United States has to make clear to the world that this is what represents the difference between autocracy and democracy. Uh, that, you know, we are proud of our freedoms, we're proud of our ability to be able to speak out, uh, to criticize the government, to self-govern ourselves, I mean, these are the principles that make democracy great. I think it's important to point out what's happening in Iran. I think it is important for the president to speak in support of those protests that are taking place. I also think it's important to be able to build an alliance with regards to confronting Iran. Uh, you know, we've built an alliance with NATO, and we're using it to confront Putin in Ukraine. I really think that the key to this dangerous world I'm talking about is the ability to build other alliances in the Middle East, working with moderate Arab countries, working with Israel, to build a strong alliance that is able to work together to contain Iran and to contain terrorism. Uh, I, would, I would do more to strengthen that such, group of such countries. As, such as and the relationships only, or do something more? I'm public. talking about not only building a security alliance, but an economic alliance as well, to be able to confront Iran and to be able to confront terrorism in the Middle East. Yeah, there are some who suggest that if you don't jump on this opportunity, you're going to miss it again. Do you feel, Director Ratcliffe, that we could miss it again? Yeah. I, 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 you know, I go back to, I think, uh, Secretary Panetta will, will uh, recall, you know, to his credit, President Obama said it was a mistake to turn, it, to turn our back on, on the Green Revolution. And when you look at what's happening in Iran, I don't, I don't, think, these are, um, I don't think these are protests. I think these, this is an uprising. Um, the average age of the population in Iran is 31. And um, uh, they're looking at a situation where uh, 83 year old men are killing 22 year old women because they're not wearing a hijab uh, properly. Um, the, the, the people there, uh, you know, we don't need to, uh, you know, we don't need to try and uh, invoke some kind of regime change. The people there want that. And I think you're going to see this uprising continue. We do need to support it. I mean, this is what. This is what we do, and this is what we're supposed to do. We're the torchbearers for, for human rights, for women's rights, and, and, and we need to be supporting that type of uprising that wants that type of uh, you know, outcome. And I do think that, um, you know, as uh, Secretary Panetta said, I mean, I do think that uh, there, there is an opportunity here for better alliances in the Middle East. I think that. Um, uh, Secretary Esper and I w worked hard on that, and I think accomplished that with the Abraham Accords, and um, uh, you know brought brought together um, Israel and some of our Arab allies um, uh, as a you know as a counter to a hegemonic Iran. And I think that uh, it's a mistake if we're not attempting to um, enhance that and uh, and work with our a Arab partners to to improve that. Secretary Esper, would you add to that? Uh, I think we definitely need to be more vocal about it. I agree with Leon that we should be forming partnerships more deeply and well integrated uh, in the region to to, uh, uh, to to push back against Iran. Look, there's there's no greater malevolent threat in the region and and beyond the region than Iran. It's causing instability and mayhem all over the place. And now they've added another you know trick to their coterie by providing uh, Russia with unarmed drones to kill Ukrainian civilians. So it only gets worse and worse. And now we have this uprising. It's being led by uh, girls and young women. And they're right. They're being killed by the, by, by the uh, IRGC and the Bajiv police. And it's just uh, in incredible. And over 300 people have been killed so far, many of them teenagers. And so I give the people credit. We should be uh, hopefully talking to the opposition and asking how can we support them. Uh, we don't want to go. We don't want to play into the, into, the, um, into the rhetoric of the regime. 
but we should look at every possible way to support them. Uh, let's talk about China here. Uh, Director Ratcliffe, two years ago today, you wrote a piece in the journal. Uh, it's titled, China is National Security Threat Number One. Uh, this was your opening line in the piece. You said, as Director of National Intelligence, I am entrusted with access to more intelligence than any member of the U.S. government other than the President of the United States. It, it's a heavy statement. Yet for, for two years, it seems that many of the headlines out of China has been whether or not it will go into Taipei. In your last year of the Trump administration, how much of that was a consideration? We talked about that a, a lot, Bill. Um, uh, we talked about you know, the challenges of um, uh, even, even just 100 miles away, uh, an amphibious assault on an island and whether or not that could be done and whether or not President Xi would, would have those intentions. I think, unfortunately, um, I'm not sure that the answer that some of the things that we talked about back then may have changed based on the events and lessons learned or things that uh, President Xi may have taken away from uh, uh, watching the response in Ukraine. In other words, um, it may be that one of, one of the takeaways, you know, he's, he is, uh, um, uh, he's one to, to, to quote history a, a lot. And he, one of the things that he has said uh, repeatedly is to quote uh, Mao Zedong and, and said that, uh, you know, Mao once said that um, if you throw the first punch the right way, 100 punches can be avoided. And so, you know, does President Xi look at the situation in Taiwan and look at the response in Ukraine and say, well, if you're going to do this, go hard and go fast? And, um, and I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. But, but uh, you know, that, uh, that op-ed that I wrote, uh, Bill, is interesting. You know, I served, as I mentioned, in the House of Representatives. I thought I, understand, I, thought I understood, part of that time was on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. I thought I really understood uh, the China threat, but when you when you get the kinds of national security cabinet positions that, that we've held, you see intelligence, you know, at a scope and a level that um, few people get to. And um, and in my time as DNI, when it when it came to China, you know, it really kind of reminded me of uh, you know you see the words in your side view mirror that say uh, objects in the mirror are closer than they appear, um, and. You know, to underscore the point of the threat from China, um, there's a classified transcript out there where I was testifying before the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, and I can say this much about it, even though it was trans uh, even though it was classified. Was uh, one of the senators asked me and said, "You know, Director, um, you want to increase the IC spending on China by 20 percent? Why?" And my response was, "Because I know you won't let me increase it by 40 <laughs> percent." And um, you know, we, we kid about it, but if, just take a snapshot. You know, I look at that op-ed, Bill, and I think, um, if anything, I, I underestimated and I, uh, uh, I underestimated the, the timing and level of China's aggression. I mean, take a snapshot of the past few months. All of us here three months ago uh, were giving interviews about state-run media um, advocating for um, the shooting down of a plane carrying the Speaker of the House if that person, if she dared land in Taiwan. Uh, last month after our midterm elections, you had the FBI director say that China interfered in the 2022 midterm elections. Not tried to influence, not tried to interfere, but interfered on behalf of uh, candidates depending on their, their views with regard to China. Um, and. You know, and then most recently, just a few days ago, in connection with these protests, I heard uh, President Xi say, uh, you know, I've heard lots of politicians say, uh, border security is national security, economic security is national security. But in response to, to the protests that are happening across China right now, his response publicly was, political security is national security. That's just a really nice way of saying by whatever means and necessary, we will protect, uh, you know, the Chinese Communist Party and the political state here in China. So, you know, the intelligence is clear about the threat that, that China poses, and I think our response needs to be I clear. just want to fast forward through the piece. Toward the end, you say, this is our once-in-a-generation challenge. You're shaking your head in agreement. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously. Yeah. I have a chapter on this in my book, by the way, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
That's one. <laughs> Wait till he swears. We haven't heard a swear word yet. Uh, China is the greatest strategic threat facing our country in this century. It's been brewing for decades now, and we've been slow to recognize it. I think an achievement of the Trump administration is that we congealed the government around, that formed a consensus. I think the Biden administration has continued that. That's good. But I think there's far more work we have to do. We have to accelerate the access of innovation from the private sector into DOD to capitalize on cutting edge technologies that are out there that some of you out there have. Uh, look, we need, a, we need to have an economic approach toward the region. I think it was uh, you know, a mistake not to pursue the original uh, TP, TPP to exclude Taiwan from the IPEF, et cetera, et cetera. There's so much more we need to be focused on because the Chinese are. And Xi Jinping is now consolidated in an unprecedented third term. He has ambitions to be recognized as Mao in the annals of Chinese history. And if we don't recognize it for what it is, we're going to find ourselves wake, waking up one morning and Taiwan is either under threat or under attack yeah. because of that. And we do not, want, do not want to be in that position. We do not need to go to war with China. But we need to do everything we can to include building our partnerships and alliances and making sure they are as robust as possible to push this threat off into the future. How do you see it? Yeah, no, you, you know, the, the fact is, and I, and I think it was true with Putin, and I think it's true with Xi, is that, uh, you know, over the past number of years, they sensed weakness on the part of the United States. Uh, and they've tried to take advantage of it. Uh, Putin went into Crimea, Putin went into Syria, Putin went into Libya, Putin conducted a cyber attack against our uh, election institutions, a bold cyber attack, uh, and he never paid a price, he never paid a price. Uh, and I think she sensed the same kind of weakness. Uh, I do think that it's been very important that we drew the line, obviously, on Putin and the Ukraine, uh, and made clear that he is going to pay a price and that he's now paying a price. And she, who I've had the opportunity to meet with, both in Washington as well as in Beijing, uh, she looks at what's happening in the Ukraine. And mark my words, is, is learning the lessons of that. And he doesn't want to see China go down that same path because of the economic implications, but also the fact that if he should go into Taiwan, the kind of resistance and calamity that that could result in. So the important point here is the United States has to deal with China from strength. And that means that we have to let him know where the lines are with regards to Taiwan, with regards to the South China Sea, uh, with regards to other issues that we're confronting with China. We have to uh, build that alliance uh, with South Korea, with Japan, with Australia, with India, with the ASEAN countries, so that we're all unified in confronting China. And lastly, I think it is also important that we do, as a result of showing this strength, show that we could still have some dialogue with them with regards to areas where we might be able to find some agreement. I don't think we ought to cut that off entirely. Uh, I, I, but I think in doing that, we have to do that from a position of strength. Yeah, it takes us to- uh, Leon mentioned something, I just want to foot stomp it. I said China is the greatest strategic threat facing our country in this century. He mentioned India. I, I think India is the most important strategic partnership that we have to cultivate in order to deal with the Chinese in the 21st century. And I'm glad to see that uh, there's been a con continuity now across four administrations, five administrations, in terms of doing that. Very critical. And we obviously see the important role that India is playing now with regard to Russia and uh, what's happening in Ukraine. So, um, I, I just want to double back a little bit here. Um, a lot of the panels today were addressing this. And it's maybe from a 35,000 foot level here. Um, when Dane and I are in America's newsroom, uh, Monday through Friday, 9 to 11 Eastern time, tell you <laughs> that, that's one. We, that's right. we take all viewers. Um, we, we have the fortune of following what I call the original Twitter feed. And for those of you who don't know, we use a software system called iNews and don't hack it. Um, and that's how we communicate with each other. That's also how we build rundowns for our shows. It's how we follow the Associated Press and the Reuters news services from all over the world. And so if something happens in the world, 
um, in all likelihood, it's going to be along that wire service. There's a more technical term for it, but it's, it's not, wire's priority, okay? You put a little lightning bolt there. And last Tuesday, when the NATO foreign ministers were meeting in Bucharest, um, the, these three headlines flashed, and I, I say, printed them out, and I saved them because I want to read them. Um, because I think it kind of get, gets to the nut of the whole issue in Ukraine and, and Moscow and NATO. Um, here's the first one. NATO foreign ministers, after first day of talks in Bucharest, we remain steadfast in our commitment to Ukraine's independence and will never recognize Russia's illegal annexations. And came another one. We will continue to strengthen our partnership with Ukraine as it advances its Euro-Atlantic aspirations. And came another one. All these are in red. They're flashing. They get your attention. They draw your eye to it. Last one. We will continue and further step up support to Ukraine and will maintain our support for as long as necessary. So then I'm thinking Putin doesn't want us there or doesn't want NATO there. And as long as he's in charge or as long as he's alive or in power, uh, he's going to fight this war. Which leads me to my question for you three here to try and settle this, the 35,000 feet, is how does this war end? Well, it's a question, obviously, that, uh, that everybody is trying to confront. And nobody has the answer, very frankly. Uh, at this stage, the most important thing is that we have brought economic sanctions against Russia, and we, can, we should continue to strengthen those sanctions because it is impacting. Secondly, we need to provide arms and weapons, uh, which we have provided, uh, the United States and NATO. Uh, and I think we have to continue to provide arms and weapons, and I think we have to provide advanced arms and weapons so that they're able to defend themselves against what Putin is resorting to. And thirdly, we've reinforced NATO countries so that we've made clear that any, any of those NATO countries that Russia tries to interfere with, we will implement Article 5 uh, and take action and defend those countries. Those are important steps. The fact is that the courageous and brave fighters of Ukraine are really at, at the point of the spear. And they're the ones that stopped the Russian invasion. And they're the ones who have now moved aggressively to try to uh, acquire additional lands that are controlled by the Russians. The bottom line is that the tide of war has changed. Russia is losing. Ukraine is winning. Putin is not going to accept that. Intelligence makes very clear that Putin is going to keep doubling down. And that's what he's doing. He's going to continue to double down. He's going to continue to resort to these terror tactics. He's going to continue to try to undermine their infrastructure, to go after civilians, to go after the targets that he's going. The only way you get Putin's attention is by force. That's the bottom line. And so it is very important that the United States and NATO continue to provide arms make clear that we're unified in support of Ukraine, and make clear that we're not going anywhere until Putin fails in his mission, period. I mean, I want to build on what, so just to build on what, what Leon's saying is, it's, it has been a strategic, operational, and tactical failure in so many ways for Vladimir Putin. He is now fighting a war on two fronts, the Ukrainian front, which soon may pivot south toward uh, uh, toward, toward Crimea, and he's fighting a second front at home. And that gives me some encouragement that he will continue to see pressure. I think he continues to get pushed in the corner by the brave Ukrainians who are, who are really doing a masterful job on the ground. And uh, he becomes more desperate, desperate. Now, there's been talk about does he rattle the, continue to rattle the nuclear saber. I think we, the United States, and preferably with our allies, need to be very clear almost a, a declaratory policy about what we would do if we see any type of movement in that space and be very clear that, that we will not allow that to happen, any use of nuclear weapons or threatening of our allies and partners. I see where that's going because I think the Ukrainians can and should continue to press this fight through the winter and keep uh, Putin on his heels and then into the, into the spring, and I think we'll be at a different position as well. well it's interesting you say that. Um, and you could very well be right. I, I don't know what the right answer is here. I don't know if there is a right answer at the moment. Uh, it was only 30 years ago where Eastern Europe thought, fought a long and brutal three-and-a-half-year war in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, it, it, 
The stakes today, Director Ratcliffe, are much higher. Uh, the players involved are much more advanced. How does this war end? Well, I, I think both secretaries are right, though. I think we're in a, in a situation here. You know, someone the other day asked me about, we, you know, we all want peace. We don't want uh, nuclear Armageddon. We don't want um, this to go where, uh, you know, in the dark recesses of, of, of people's minds it, it, it goes. Um, but, but the simple truth is, as uh, Secretary Esper said, uh, Russia is losing and Russia can lose. Um, we do need to be arming Ukraine. Uh, Secretary Del Toro and I were talking about this last night. One of, the, one of the benefits of the Ukrainians is because for the last few years they've been fighting and we've been arming them and training them and working with them, um, it has really worked to, to their advantage and part of the reason over the years why, why they uh, are now having the kind of success that they're, that they're having against Russians. The problem with, you know, someone asked me the other day, will you sign this letter about, um, you know, uh, about forcing peace negotiations? And I said, no, because I, I, I don't think that's the right, uh, I don't think that's the right play here. Um, uh, Putin would love to have a ceasefire to regroup, uh, resupply. Uh, we know that he doesn't care how many troops at the end of the day um, uh, he loses. But on the other side, and many of us have talked to the Ukrainians or been to Ukraine and, and, and talked about it, you know, countless um, uh, Ukrainian uh, women, children, and, and men um, have been shot in the back of the head. Um, uh, the war crimes here are, are, very, uh, are very clear, and the Ukrainians aren't going to walk away from that. So some sort of a land peace deal um, where uh, Putin agrees to something, but they're, um, he's certainly not going to agree to any kind of a, a peace deal where he's guilty of war crimes, um, but that is... Um, but this, this is hard stuff, isn't it? I mean, I listened to your answers and... And, and so it, I think what we're all elusive. saying is, is that, that Ukraine needs to win and the United States needs to, uh, to support Ukraine uh, to that end. And, you know, there are questions about Putin's health there are questions about his support uh, within Russia. We don't know the, the answers how that's going to play out, but we do know that the Ukrainians are winning every day, and uh, by supporting them uh, fully and completely. And I know that's not popular uh, necessarily with with um, with all Americans, but I think that that is very clearly uh, the best outcome and the best. Um, you know, situation for the United States to pursue. We, yeah, yeah we got to be bottom careful. Bottom line is, we got a bully who's cornered. We got a bully who's cornered. Uh, and when a bully is cornered, uh, he's going to try to strike out, and that's what he's doing. He's trying to strike out in any way he can to try to say he's still around, that he still has some leverage here. He's trying to break the will of the Ukrainian people, and he's trying to break the will of the United States and our NATO allies. That's what this is all about. And that's why we have to resist it. And that's why we have to keep him cornered. Because ultimately, it is going to be up to Putin to decide whether or not he is ultimately going to negotiate some kind of settlement, even though it'll be interpreted as a loss. Uh, at least he'll, he'll try to maybe get something that he can say he, you know, he was able to retain. Or secondly, he's going to get brought down because the hardliners in Moscow are not going to continue to take the losses that Putin uh, and the Russians are getting in Ukraine. They've already criticized him. They've already pushed him around. He's reacting to the bullies. He's reacting to the hardliners. Uh, I think ultimately the hardliners will move to basically remove Putin. Oh. And I think building on that, we got to be very careful not to self-deter, not to try and get inside his head and think about this and think about that, and maybe we shouldn't do this. I mean, that's what he's counting on. We need to take that Reagan-esque Reagan -esque approach and follow through based on our principles. You got to stand up to the bullies. You know, we wrung our hands months ago when, we, when there was early talk about Sweden and Finland joining the alliance, and people said, oh, no, we shouldn't. We can't do that. Putin, may, he may do this, he may do that. And then it happened. And months later, Putin says, well, it's OK, as long as they don't put nuclear weapons there or something like that. We've been doing that with weapon systems as well. And you, every now and then, you have another country in Europe put out an idea, well, maybe there should be a negotiation, or maybe they should give, they should give uh, uh, Putin Crimea, but keep the Donbass. Look, 
That's baloney. We should stick to our principles, stand up to Putin, continue to supply and support the Ukrainians, and help them win this fight. They are winning. Putin can be beaten. I think, I think the most important thing we could do right now is to help provide a comprehensive air defense system mm -hmm. for Ukraine. Amen. To be able to take down these missiles that they continue to fire. I mean, we, we work with Israel to develop the Iron Dome system. That system takes down over 90% of the missiles that are fired by Hamas. We need to get to the same numbers in Ukraine. Can you explain the hesitation there then? Pardon me? Can you explain the hesitation? I, uh, as, well, as, as, it, as it's, why, it's Israel and Russia, and uh, that's the connection. Is. I think they're, they're, uh, Israel has a hesitation about uh, the Iron Dome and some of its uh, capabilities, but I think the United sorry, States... Sorry, I wasn't referring specifically to well, Tel Aviv offering it. No, I, I, I think, we the, have I think the United States to. can provide a comprehensive air defense system. Well, we, we've been too slow. Look, we have CRAM gun systems we could deploy now to shoot down drones. We have, we have air defense systems. Our allies have air defense systems. I think, you know, as, as good as the support has been to Ukrainians and as unified as NATO has been, we have been slow at times. We have been tentative at times. We should have provided the MiGs months ago. The Germans should be providing tanks, and we should be pushing as much air defense as we can into that country, because right now Putin's doing everything he can to make sure that, that the Ukrainians have a cold, dark winter. And, uh, and by knocking out their infrastructure, and the only way you're going to defeat that is by putting up a robust air defense from the ground up. So the longer this grinds on, you would think that, that is, those decisions are inevitable. Yes, but we, you know, we announced the other day, it's good that we're providing, for example, NASAMs, but we learned that they'll arrive in 24 months. I mean, they need them in 24 days. So now you're into a war that's three years old, and it's just like 30 years hence. You got, you got to stick with it. Bill, you've got to stick with it. The bottom line here is that, it, yes, it's a dangerous situation, but this is the most pivotal war we've been involved in, probably since World War II. Mm -hmm. And it's pivotal because what happens there will tell us a hell of a lot about what happens to democracies in the 21st century. We cannot afford to lose in Ukraine, period. Let's talk about Washington, D.C., <clears throat> if we must. <clears throat> Last year, Secretary Panetta, you said, we basically govern by crisis. <clears throat> Actually, the quote is. <laughs> <laughs> I can get the full one for you if you want. No, it's a... You said, for God's sakes, <laughs> <laughs> responsible governing is about not allowing crisis to happen. It's about finding ways to solve those crises. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I, Panetta's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I tell the students at the Panetta Institute that in a democracy we govern either by leadership or by crisis. If leadership is there and willing to take the risks associated with leadership, and that's, that's the fundamental problem, if you're going to be a leader, you're going to have to take risks and do things that may offend your base, it may offend your party, it may offend others, but it's the right thing to do. If we have that kind of leadership, we can avoid crisis, certainly contain it. But if leadership is not there, then we'll govern by crisis. And for, for too long, Washington has largely governed by crisis. You have to, rather than, than getting people angry because you want to cut their benefits or raise their taxes, you basically stand back and let crisis happen. And, and that happens with the budget all the time. That's why the, the defense system is, is having problems because the Congress has a broken budget process. And so what happens then is that you wait for crisis and then you say, crisis is the reason I got to do something. And rather than solving the problem, you just use a Band-Aid and kick the can down the road. That's been what's happening for a long time in Washington. And so ultimately, you know, if we're going to be able to confront the challenges that we have to confront, then leadership is going to have to step up on both sides. Both Republicans and Democrats have to stand up I mean, if there's any message, for God's sakes, that came out of the midterm election, 
is that the American people want the Republicans and Democrats to work together to govern, to govern this country. Not just to play politics, not just to play political theater, but to govern and deal with the issues that we have to confront. And to do that, we need leadership. Mm -hmm. Director Radcliffe, you're not too removed from that jaunt up and down Pennsylvania Avenue. What do you make of the reality that he's laying out for us here? Well, I think um, Secretary Panetta, to agree with Secretary Panetta, is right. Um, um, but I will say this, that this is uh, the, the problems with um, the legislative branch and members, due respect to some of my colleagues that are, that are out there um, from the House and, and some senators that I've, that I've been with, um, this is not a new tale that we're talking about, uh, about the inefficiencies here and the inability to work together. Um, you know, having experienced both, I, I will say um, where leadership is particularly important and right now about the crisis that we're, we're talking about is, uh, is, in, is within the executive branch because, um, you know, in, in the national security cabinet level positions, um, you do have to some ability um, to um, move more efficiently and make decisions uh, where you don't have to wait on the House and the Senate uh, when it comes to national security decisions and issues. And so having good leadership within, within a cabinet, um, it, it, you know, I have found from experiences is, is incredibly important. And it's one of the things that, you know, I think as the current administration looks at um, the crises that are happening uh, around the globe that, you know, that they focus on where they're doing well and there are some places where they are and other places where they're not. And if changes need to be made there, um, then, then they should be made because, um, again, I think this is the most direct route uh, to doing well when it comes to national security issues. See, we didn't have to deal with Mark? I mean, imagine that. Well, do, they, they, do you agree with his statement about the, the results of the midterms in early November? I do. I mean, I think that the American people are tired of, uh, you talked about, uh, you talked about, you know, crisis. Uh, but they're tired of chaos and they're tired of, um, you know, and, and we've been um, in, in the middle of sort of a heightened level of, uh, of chaos when it, when it comes to partisanship um, in Washington, D.C. at a level that, you know, you didn't experience in your time. Um, Mark and I both experienced it. Um, and it continues today um, in, in the current administration, and it's not a great place to be. I mean, we've all seen better times and better places and have, have good examples of that. Um, and so uh, I do think the American people are, are sending a message um, that they do want that, that they, you know, that bipartisanship is not a dirty word, and, um, and that the extremes on, on the ends of both parties um, are, are uh, leading uh, the entire group astray at times. And that this, to your point about this is where good leadership is standing up to that. And even though it's taking criticism, um, you've got to take those arrows um, and stick by your principles uh, and uh, you know, do the right things that, that the American people want. Yeah, no, look, Joe, I, I, if, I if Mitch McConnell were sitting here or President Biden were sitting here, they'd say, we did infrastructure and yeah. uh, we did the CHIPS Act and... Sure, sure, but... No, but that's but, right. The, but there are bigger issues out there. They would argue they're getting things done. Go ahead. But I think they are. They, they are getting some things done. They are, but we got far bigger issues that require leadership from both uh, the Congress and the executive branch. And we're, we're here in the Reagan Library. So look at what, you know, Reagan and and Tip O'Neill were able to do. I mean, it's, it's, all those are good, right? The, the CHIPS Act, et cetera, et cetera. What about the debt? It's $31 trillion right now. It's gonna increase because of interest rates. We got immigration policies. It's been, we need an immigration policy to deal with the challenge face our country. Uh, you know, we talk about defense budget, those types of things. The issues go on and on and on that need to be dealt with, but instead we have leadership that is looking in two-year cycles. What can we do or block the other side from doing so we can win in the next midterm? And, or in the next even year. And that's what's happening. We need more of a strategic look. Um, your question about the election, I just want to jump to that real quick. I, I, I think what Leon said is right, but I, I saw something different from the election. And I, I saw uh, an astute American electorate that was concerned about democracy and about picking good people to come to Congress. 
uh, come to D.C. And it was reassuring to see that voters, particularly on the Republican side, were willing to kind of make different choices about who they want to send to the country in or into the capital so that they can solve the problems that we're discussing. And that gave me uh, more confidence in the American electorate about the choices they make and what we have but, going you know, forward. I, I would just add, add to the midterms. I mean, I think, I think the midterms obviously sent a very important message about the importance of working together. I think the American people rejected extremism on both sides. Mm -hmm. I think the American people rejected election deniers. Uh, and they basically said, we want stability. We want stability in our country, for God's sakes. Um, I, you know, look, with great respect, the president does have to work with the Congress, and the Congress has to work with the president. I've seen Washington work at its best, and I've seen Washington at its worst. The good news is I saw Washington work. I mean, when Ronald Reagan was president, Tip O'Neill, the speaker, and Bob Michael had a close relationship. They had their differences. Bob Michael was the minority leader. Tip was the, the Democratic speaker from Boston, Democrats, Democrat. But when it came to big issues, they worked together. In the Reagan administration, just to give you an example, we passed social security reform, the third rail of politics. We passed social security reform, bipartisan vote. We passed immigration reform. God, what an outrage. Imagine passing immigration reform. Something this Congress and, and past these last few Congresses have struggled to try to deal with immigration, which everybody knows is broken now. We passed immigration reform, bipartisan. We cut a deal. We passed tax reform. We simplified the tax system. On a bipartisan vote. I mean, we got to get back to that. We got to get back to working together. And frankly, you know, we talk about regular order. The fact is, most members of Congress don't know anymore what the hell regular order is. I mean, I, I talk to kids at the Panetta Institute, I've got to educate them what the hell regular order is all about. The fact that you introduce a bill that it goes to a committee, that the subcommittee has hearings and votes on it, that the committee votes on, on the bill and has hearings, and that it goes to the floor of the, of the House. Imagine members of Congress actually working and voting on legislation rather than having the leadership say what, what needs to be passed. That's, that's what's made this system great. We got to get back to that. We got to get back to that. And frankly, We've got to start educating young people about the importance of getting back to good democracy. Because right now, very frankly, most kids don't understand how the hell our democracy is supposed to work. And that, that's creating a real gap in terms of this new generation of leaders that has to come forward in order to take care of this country. Thank you for sharing that. Very strong, very powerful. Coming out to the Reagan Institute, I, I think we're reminded of three things, uh, leadership, and clarity of mission and peace through strength, America remains. We'll see if we're up to it. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here tonight. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, everyone.